Hi, everyone. A uh, very uh, good morning uh, from the US and a good evening to all my friends in India and Pakistan and welcome to this Davos Dialogue on digital equity in India, Pakistan and beyond, uh, which is brought to you by Future Tense, which is a collaboration of New America, Slate Magazine and the Arizona State University that explores impact of technology, emerging technologies on society and by the Global Shape of Community Bangalore, which is a youth-led community addressing civic and social issues related to sustainable fashion, conscious consumerism, mental health, and of course, bridging the digital divide. Uh, my name is Rashi Saxena, and I am your moderator for today. Uh, we have a fabulous panel discussion. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a social innovation practitioner and project-based consultant out of Bangalore. I serve as the Global Project Coordinator for HateBase, the Sentinel project that works with governments, academia, researchers to monitor hate speech online. Uh, we also analyze the correlation between online hate speech uh, that can result in offline violence. Uh, but just to give you a disclaimer, we're not going to talk about hate speech online, although yes, the, the topic is directly related to it. Uh, I'm going to talk about this conversation can, is also live streamed on Slate's YouTube channel, so you can also feel free to watch it there. Uh, you can also follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag digital equity uh, by following future tense on Twitter. Uh, so now that we've begun, I'd also encourage uh, everyone who's joined in to introduce yourselves on the chat and tell us where you are logging in from and what you expect to take away from this dialogue. Uh, to start us off, um, I'll talk a little briefly about Davos Labs and how it came to be. The Davos Labs is a global shaper community, uh, it's perhaps the first and the largest youth driven recovery plan, uh, 10 week recovery plan to address the world's converging crises after the year we've had so far. Uh, we've identified 10 pillars, uh, and some of them are mental health, inclusive jobs, public health. Uh, conscious consumerism. This particular dialogue falls into the category of digital literacy and digital access. Uh, we're basically looking to inspire, mobilize, and empower young people to shape the unprecedented grassroots global responses needed to address during the coronavirus pandemic. And some of the ways that we did do it, we launched it on World Youth Day uh, in the form of surveys and dialogues. Uh, so if you do want your voice to be heard, uh, these, all of these responses would be aggregated and these also would be culminated into a youth recovery plan and a report in the form of a report which would be presented. So I think I just wanted to check the chat a bit and see if you're introducing yourselves. So yeah, we, I'm also going to now move on to introducing our lovely panelists. We have Joining in from India, we have Amrita Chaudhary, who is the director of CCAOI and representing the interests of the internet users and has been working in, in, the, in this space for over more than 15 years. Uh, Amrita is also the president of the Internet Society Delhi chapter. She's also a United, Gov United International Governance Forum MAG member. She's the vice chair of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF. Uh, she heads the Women's Special in Internet Group of Internet Society and is also the nominating committee 2021 member at ICANN. She's one of the founding members of the India School of Internet Governance, uh, for which I was also a fellow for in 2019 and curates regularly for the Gen Geneva Internet Platform and advises and guides the Youth IGF, which is a youth initiative in India. And, and rural communities at the Internet Society. So very warm welcome to Amrita. Uh, we have Faraz Salim from Pakistan, who is a business professional with 22 years of experience in business consulting in emerging markets. Uh, he's worked with a number of multinational conglomerates in strategy, execution, marketing and communication, and business technology implementation. Uh, he successfully set up and operated a boutique business consulting and research firm, Elisa Consulting, and he's currently serving as the general manager at Dawood Hercules Group. And he's also known for his passion and driving change and initiating projects and strategies that implement, that are looking at implementing from a technological level, uh, management changeovers, and also uh, bringing about corporate branding executions. 
Uh, we have Sarah Morris, uh, who's the director of New America's Open Technology Institute, where she leads OTI's strategic planning, fundraising, and management. Prior to her role as director, she's also led the program's efforts on a broad portfolio of issues which include broadband access and adoption, something that we're going to talk about a lot here, online consumer protection, and preserving the open internet. She's also a regular contributor to The Hill and frequently writes for a variety of other national outlets. Prior to joining New America, Morris was also a fellow with the public interest firm Media Access Project, where she assisted with research and drafting of FCC comments on a wide range of key communication issues. And with that, uh, I, we're going to start with the opening remarks from our panelists. So, uh, Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Rachi, for that um, wonderful introduction. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be on this panel uh, with uh, such an esteemed set of panelists. I'm already excited for the discussion based on just the conversations we had uh, in the lead up to, to the session. Um, I'm Sarah Morris. I run the Open Technology Institute, which is a program within the broader New America umbrella. Um, OTI focuses on um, research and analysis and advocacy on a variety of tech policy topics. Um, our aim is to ensure that all communities have equitable access to technology and that they're able to benefit from that technology rather than be harmed by it. Um, our, our issues span many of the, the issues that Rashi mentioned in her, inter, in, in, um, her intro of me, um, everything from broadband access and adoption to government surveillance to encryption, data privacy, um, uh, content moderation, and uh, AI decision-making, algorithmic decision-making, um, and, and net neutrality and other uh, consumer protection issues online. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, broadband access and adoption is an issue I've worked on throughout my entire 10 year, 10 year tenure at OTI. And um, I'm, I'm, as we'll discuss, I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity to think about this in, in a, at a time when there's so much attention to the issue. Um, there's numerous ways that you can approach the, the question of digital equity um, even just thinking about this from the United States, from a United States perspective, um, to help sort of ground our conversation a bit, I'll start start by uh, providing an overview of some fi of findings from our research project um, that we've completed over various years. But the most recent iteration we released last summer, it's called the Cost of Connectivity, and it's research that compares um, internet access in um, on data on 760 internet plans across 28 cities in the United States and around the world. Um, one goal of the project was to see how the United States compared in terms of cost and um, speeds to countries, to other countries and cities, but also to, to provide a snapshot um, of connectivity in the United States. Many, over 450 plans, I believe, were US-based um, plans. And, and part of that, as we'll talk about later, is to fill in a gap um, of data that, that we're missing from the federal government um, about pricing information. And our findings were, were really, really telling. Um, our top finding was basically just that we find substantial evidence of an affordability crisis in the United States. Internet access is simply too expensive. Um, we're number one for highest average monthly price when compared to cities in Europe and Asia. The average price for internet service in the United States is 68, according to our research, is $68.38. Um, this is simply unaffordable for millions of, of, of people who um, either lack access or have um, uh, access that is not sufficient to, to do the myriad things that are required in this digitally dependent society. Um, and the other thing I'll note about cost in the United States, which differs um, at least to degree, if not in, in, um, in concept more generally to, to other, other cities is that, um, that that price of $68.38 a month is an incomplete quick picture. Modem fees can add up to 75% um, to a monthly bill, 75% or, or on average to a monthly bill in the United States compared to just um, a 30% addition abroad. Um, in addition, many US plans use promotional rates and um, that $68.38 um, average price 
does uh, is based on the promotional, the, the immediately advertised price. And so when that promotional rate expires, the the uh, the price per service per month can in, will increase on average by $22.25 a month, um, which is, is pretty dramatic. And But finally, we see one bright spot in the research, and that's that municipal networks offer some of the best value um, in the United States. Um, and we'll dig into this a little bit more when we think about um, solutions and the way that we, the models that we use to try to solve the, the connectivity and affordability crisis. Um, but there were there were sort of three buckets of uh, beyond those takeaways, three three primary areas of focus when we think about where we go from here or how we define the problem, um, and it's affordability, transparency, and competition. I've already talked about the affordability um, component, but also there's this dramatic uh, transparency problem. Um, internet users in in the United States and often and in other locations as well, simply don't have a good understanding of how much internet service actually costs. So it's very difficult to make a, an informed decision when it comes to subscribing to various plans. Um, and so we've advocated for a broadband nutrition label that essentially provides all of the relevant information about uh, quality of service, cost, including any policies around overage fees, any data caps, et cetera. Um, as a consume, as an as an internet user facing tool to um, assess the 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 actual thing that's being that's being offered in the market, um, and we've also urged the FCC to collect better data on pricing so that organizations like the Open Technology Institute don't have to bear that full um, burden of doing of doing the research. Um, so that's affordability, transparency, and competition. As I mentioned, um, community networks, municipal networks can provide incredible um, competitive benefits in, in um, areas where they operate, serving to drive down costs and improve services where there are um, insufficient, um, is insufficient competition and connectivity already. And so we'll talk about this, those potential solutions and how they play out in the context of a uh, policy as we go through the conversation. But for now, I will stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, and now um, I'll move to Faraz. Uh, and for us, is going to cover one of the most important core elements of digital access, which is infrastructure. Over to you, Faraz. Great, thank you, uh, Rashi and uh, uh, Sarah. That 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 was a great explanation or or detail about what you do. So, definitely not as exciting as what you're doing. But I I, I come here uh, representing a group of dreamers and doers, and I bring today. I bring a dream. Um, but before I share the dream, let me just set the stage a little bit. Uh, and, and coming from Pakistan, a, a, a country in South Asia, uh, where there's an opportunity to connect the next billion internet uh, users, uh, let me set some uh, statistics about Pakistan itself. Uh, there's 84.2% of tele density, um, and 3G and 4G penetration is at about 44%. Uh, broadband stands at 45%. And now being a part of a, an organization of dreamers and doers, uh, we end up thinking systems and we end up uh, wanting to design for humans. So, um, and, and, and somewhere the math doesn't add up because, uh, you know, some component is, is needs, needs a little more attention. And why do we say that? Because out of a, uh, in a country with, where there are 220 million people, um, there's only 1 million freelancers that, that are registered. And there are about half a million SMEs and individuals that are part of the digital economy. So, um, and so I'm gonna repeat that this region uh, has the opportunity to connect the next billion people. And it is vastly different from the unconnected population of the world. The average is about 40% of the earth is not connected to a data network. So if we were to talk about digital exclusion um, or inclusion, so to speak, um, it happens by giving access to uh, infrastructure, data connectivity, and personal technology. And there's no secret that for developing countries, uh, mobile broadband is directly proportional to high macro and microeconomic benefits. So, um, and, and, and 
since cities in most developing countries enjoy a decent connection, uh, I'm gonna, I, I bring a dream for the rural population. And the dream uh, is, imagine there's a remote village up in the hills that has barely 2000 people. And uh, imagine how it would be if they were on the network, had access to data, had power to, to, to electrify a small school, uh, had uh, the uh, enough ability to not only connect to the network, but uh, buy and sell, uh, connect with other people, buy and sell, and also learn and teach. And, and, and this dream is, I, I, I think, what, what of recent has started really, really resonating with me. So, um, and, and the group that I belong to uh, started their, uh, you know, their, their journey in this, uh, in, in their humble uh, effort to uh, set up a tower sharing business. A tower sharing business where you have in, in areas where it doesn't make sense for one mobile network operator to um, set up a tower and then make it feasible for them. Uh, this entity within our group sets up towers and puts up uh, uh, you know, antenna for multiple mobile network operators. And it some, suddenly starts making financial sense for not only us, but of course, for the mobile network operator. And, but, but the beneficiary uh, of, of that uh, commercial thought process is the person who has not been on the network so far. So, um, and, and, and our spirit has been very simple. We make things first available, then affordable, and then sustainable. So with that, um, I, 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 can, I can say for sure uh, that, that we wouldn't have been able to do this without partners. And uh, partnerships are what are going to make this happen. So, um, and, and, and you know, the Professor Strauss's stakeholder capitalism says designed for all of your stakeholders, not just your shareholders. And it's not just about return. It's about return to society. It's about return to shareholders. It's about return to employees. It's, it's, it's a plethora of people. So, um, and interestingly, a, a little while ago uh, in, in an event, I was uh, attending uh, Tech Mahindra's uh, Chandra Prakash Gurani also mentioned that public private partnership is what is going to make all of these things happen. Um, but I'm, I'm here to like, just leave this uh, for everybody to, you know, look, look it up. There's something called the Edison Alliance and it intends to uh, prove that partnerships are what, is, what are going to connect the next billion people. Um, and, uh, I, and, and I think there's a great model out there uh, through the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Um, and, and there's a charter in there called Terra Carta. And they propose that public, private, and philanthropic partnerships are what are going to solve the most pressing problems of our time. So uh, with that, I, I yield the floor. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope uh, my dream has been conveyed, our dream actually. So thank you. Thanks for us for that discussion. Uh, we now move on uh, to Amrita, but before that, I also wanted to tell the audience that uh, you are allowed to ask any questions uh, and please feel uh, we will address them towards a little bit towards the end. So if you have any questions and also feel free to share any resources uh, that you think are interesting and we'd love to see the chat being as animated and as, uh, as the discussion is at the moment. Uh, so now we move on to Amrita and Amrita is going to talk a little bit about uh, her journey uh, in the in the policy space, right from starting with cyber cafes to what the landscape is now. Uh, over to you, Amrita. Thank you, Rashi. Am I audible? Because I was having some connectivity issue. Is it okay? It's okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, I've been in the Indian perspective and what we at CCAY have been doing. Um, if you look at India, we are very interestingly placed. We are the second largest in, we have the second largest internet user population, which is around 767 um, million broadband users as per the regulators uh, December end report, the January end report. However, we have more than 60% people yet to be connected online. 
um, we have a huge digital divide. And if we look at what the pandemic has brought in is our reliance on the internet, uh, be it for shopping, health, education, get, getting the basic uh, government services, etc. Everything has gone online. Uh, however, the pandemic has also highlighted that uh, you know the people who have internet, uh, the way they have benefited, and the people who have not. People have been pushed further back. Um, a study by Oxfam says that 80% of the students um, have not been able to attend their, their classes because of lack of internet during the pandemic and many of them may not be able to come back to schools. So that is the stark reality we uh, have. And obviously we have a huge gender divide. While you know the government is having a lot of regulatory mechanisms, policies to do with, telecom players are also working. And interestingly, India has the lowest telecom rates, even the internet rates, but still in some places, it is expensive. It is not, you know, the accessibility is an issue. Simultaneously, how people will use, what they would be using, the demand part is also a challenge. And again, with that is uh, mindsets, as in, you know, we have a patriarchal society. So many places, women having a mobile or an internet is something like uh, the family is losing control in certain so societies. That's what we have seen. So these are certain challenges we have. And there are opportunities. There are women who have used the internet. And, uh, you know, they have actually benefited. Their entire families have benefited. We are recently doing a study for um, the a, a for AI, uh, where we are looking at the cost of exclusion. And we have had some wonderful stories of how women have actually benefited, um, you know, even from the remote areas. So we at CCAOI, we do a lot of work. Um, we are involved in the access issue. We, pro we are always a proponent that uh, access should be provided to people, be it shared access, because not everyone are digitally literate. They may not have the necessary infrastructure or skills. So shared access through public kiosks, cyber cafes, et cetera, is something we advocated 12 years back. We also believe in having internet in the local languages uh, with the National Internet Exchange of India. We've uh, trained about 2.5. 5 million um, people on 0.25 million people on uh, digital literacy in local six languages. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research on the, uh, various aspects um, to build capacity at different levels. We have a monthly digital newsletter which we come up to share information about the various issues which are going. We have stakeholder discussion, involve people to come and discuss on the public policies which are being discussed, be it privacy, be it security, be it data protection, because even if you are using the internet, these things are important. Um, we are uh, doing some work on training senior citizens on safe literacy because, you know, they have the pandemic has pushed them into the internet, but they really don't know how to protect themselves as well as look at fake news, misinformation, etc. So we're doing a lot of work. But what uh, I have seen in my uh, 15 years of experience on, in this sphere is it is not something which one stakeholder can do themselves. If we want internet to be the same for everyone, um, we need to empower people and all stakeholders, be it government, business, civil society, have to work together. And uh, only then can we achieve some level of, um, you know, what we are aiming at, the universal access. So Rashi, that's my uh, initial comments. I'm happy to comment on any of your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Amrita. Uh, yeah, just some food for thought for the audience. We have a few questions for you on Mentimeter. So uh, we have around three to four questions and we wanted you to answer it. I'm uh, going to share it on the screen at the moment. So uh, you need to go to Mentimeter.com, menti.com and use the code 6628-8272. Uh, the first question is, what do you think the term digital rights means? And you have one minute. The 39 attendees have one minute to answer that.
also maybe i could be a little clearer so you we we trying to understand what do you think about the term digital rights and do you think it should be equated with human rights because we've seen most of our essential services especially during the pandemic that require the use of digital services and perhaps my my friends and and my neighbors in india and pakistan would agree that we used to talk about roti kapra kapra and makan but now it's roti kapra makan and data uh so the you know how how essential has it been for you so yeah that's okay so you see knowing your legal rights human right propriety access is anyone think that digital rights or the internet should also be seen as a public service perhaps uh okay we'll move on to the next question so who do you think should be responsible for educating citizens about their digital rights uh, is it government is it tech companies is it the citizens themselves feel free to answer that yeah and umar umar says that we have a charter of human rights and principles of the internet the internet internet rights and principles coalition and uh, umar please feel free to share those resources uh, on chat next year people educators Yeah, we do have a combination of all of them a lot of people say government or people say tech companies nobody saying citizens themselves so are we trying to derive the fact that citizens can't take matters in their own hands what do we do basic human right okay we move on to the next question which will be really interesting so what are the initiatives that you've come across in your region that promote digital access and inclusion uh you could mention the links on the chat and yeah uh, responses and maybe if the panelists want to also chime in and but then yeah we're going to we're going to talk about this in detail and we're trying to understand what our audience feels about these questions internet sat in free thinking of our line i work in tech so understand on laptop per child that's something that is also echoed by the affordable alliance that amrita was talking about triple helix joint education for your traffic non profit community networks digital literacy from on youtube ngos let's get some some more responses for this Okay, do we move on to the next question? What are the main obstacles and barriers faced by women and girls to access digital technologies and participate in digital life? Okay. 
cost, okay? Social numbers, okay? Privacy violations, that's a good one. Lack of literacy is also a good one. Most of the devices aren't necessarily designed for keeping women and girls in mind. Also see educational opportunities. Harassment issues, yes, a lot, of, a lot of them aren't confident enough and they also aren't comfortable loaning devices for the work that they want to do or for studying. Okay, patriarchy wins, yeah, is the top answer. Uh, can we move on to the next question? And, the, and this is our final question. What are some possible solutions for enhanced digital inclusion for women and girls? I think by, by litigation, you mean stronger litigation, stronger advocacy, but it was, I, I, I can say at least from India, it's better implementation of the laws. Privacy rights, stronger online regulation, advocacy. Welcoming safe space. Okay, all right. Are we going to move on? Uh, just another reminder uh, for the audience that please feel free to post your questions. Uh, we would be taking them uh, once this discussion is in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to jump back on with the panelists and maybe can start for us. Uh, you were talking about how uh, private entities and governments need to come together uh, to solve this. And, might also seem as a very ambitious plan because you'll have different targets, you'll have different motivations. Uh, how do you how, how do you see that? How do you see that coming together? And what are the examples, if you have any, uh, of successful private and public partnerships that could help us bridge this digital divide? Sure, sure. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for the question, Rashi. I there are many many examples of public-private partnership being successful. Uh, but the proposal over here is a little different. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that private sector brings its agility and the ability to do things, uh, while public sector brings its uh, blanket approach to populations once they define what is required or best for, for uh, their, their populace. And philanthropy actually bridges a gap uh, that is uh, a need unmet. So, and, and, and in order to reframe the problem statement, we all need to come together and figure out what exactly is it that we're trying to do. I mean, the, the proverb is, 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 you know, don't give a man some fish, teach them how to fish. So in order for us to, to come together, we need to be able to create a system through which value creation happens. And philanthropy uh, would be imp an important partner to bring into the public-private uh, uh, equation. So how does that happen? And I'm gonna quickly, quickly uh, explain this. For example, if it, uh, an area uh, for connectivity doesn't make sense for the private sector, and the public uh, and, and government doesn't think, uh, does, doesn't have an arm for investment, then, Philanthropy can always bridge the gap because 
the arbitrage for quality of life improving is, is you can't measure that. So, thank you. Thanks for us. Uh, so we also have a question, Amita, where how do you think governments in India, uh, the state governments or the central governments are enabling environments that allow us to achieve digital access? Um, are there any programs, are there any schemes? We've also seen that during the pandemic, we've also been heavily reliant on e-commerce. We've also, uh, also seen a rise in digital payments. Uh, how, how, how have you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is my audio better now, Rashi, than earlier? It's a lot better, it's a lot better. Okay. Right. And maybe Thanks. I can so, uh, that with those weaker, you could also switch off your camera so that we could hear you, but it's absolutely okay. better now. Okay. Um, so, um, there are various initiatives of the government in India to connect people because the government has a plan to connect all Indians. For example, uh, one would be building the infrastructure like the fiber optic network to take it to about uh, 0.25 million villages, which we call as gram panchayats. Uh, similarly, this is done in public-private partnership uh, using the universal access uh, UASG funds. Um, then there is also something called the common service centers. Uh, in the rural areas managed by young entrepreneurs to provide um, the digital, because not everyone has devices or are digitally literate. Uh, similarly, we have um, just recently the government has announced something called the PM Vani, which is to actually provide private Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi networks across the country. So there are similarly various initiatives. There are digital literacy courses, et cetera, which the government has initiated, um, which is good, but there is more to be done. And it is, as I mentioned earlier, it is just not the government who has to do so. Um, during the pandemic, we definitely saw the rise of use of, uh, you know, the uh, online medium for everything, even a shopkeeper for today, or even a vegetable seller is now using WhatsApp uh, or using payment modes, mobile payment because that is helping their business, uh, you know, uh, economic strata understand the benefit they get. Uh, by using uh, the digital medium, they start using it. They, uh, it, it is, it's not only affordability, access, um, it is affordable in India, but when a person sees value in using that in their lives, in, in earning their living, they will definitely say. Thanks, Amrita. Um, no, but you actually brought a pretty important point there when you said that digital inclusion, especially if you're looking at scaling and scalability, the government does have a much larger bandwidth for that. But, you know, digital literacy right now, given how the internet has penetrated into our lives and it affects us from a social level and it can also hamper us economically, uh, it can't be just a one-off course, right? It has to be something more holistic, something more consistent. And maybe Sarah, if you could also point in as to what are the efforts that you all have made, what are the policy recommendations you all have come in and does net neutrality really help in this situation of providing accessibility and how, and how do you think you can bridge the divide where there are certain aspect of the community that gets marginalized in this fourth industrial revolution? Sure. Thanks, Rashi. Um, I'll, I'll take with the first question. Uh, it, following up on the digital literacy point, um, one thing I would add in terms of, in addition to thinking about digital literacy as a sustainable, a sustained thing, not just a one-off course or or um, interaction, um, we've also seen the most success with digital literacy. Um, efforts that are community driven, that are are developed by and for the community. Um, or co-created with community partners. Um, and that helps both foster a sense of uh, 
um, engagement and ownership of that of that process, um, but also builds trust with community members. We often see less successful models that involve um, the private sector, particularly uh, the internet service providers, uh, who the these who the populations that are not on yet online are unlikely to trust either because they've had um, negative interactions. Um, with service being cut off or with with bill paying in the past, or they just haven't um, yet found a level of um, of comfort and safety in getting online. And so developing um, those that digital literacy shared learning at the community level helps foster that trust among members of the community who who are are already there. Um, now that's hard, right? We need we need partners, we need community organizations um, in those communities to help support and and um, sustain those programs and those efforts. And we need um, investment at the federal level and state level in those programs to make and and by the the philanthropic sector to make sure that those programs are durable and adaptive. Um, but I think digital literacy is a critical component as we think about. Um, you know, this continuum of availability and access, adoption and affordability, and then use and um, and and um, engagement. Um, and, and, you know, and, and there are, this relates to the question of net neutrality too. So for us, um, sometimes I think people think that net neutrality is not a question that is directly linked to um, digital equity, but we really believe that it is, that your, that your inner your access to the internet should be unencumbered by the internet service provider who is who is um, provisioning the service, and that you as the internet user should be able to navigate um, anywhere you want to go um, on the internet without fear of of being blocked or having certain content prioritized um, behind the scenes over others. And so, uh, the Open Technology Institute has been a staunch advocate for strong net neutrality protections. And we're really hopeful that in this administration, this new administration in the United States and the FC, well, and in the a, a new FCC with a shift in leadership, that we will see um, movement back towards the, the strong net neutrality rules that were implemented in the United States in 2015. But, but there's a broader question here and um, uh, with apologies for going a little bit into the, the, the US politics but and, and policies, but the, the same mechanism that made net neutrality uh, possible from a, a practical standpoint and a legal standpoint was treating the internet as a utility, saying it is it, we need to deliver it you know, and, and oversee it in a way that allows um, the, the federal government to intervene where directly where there are consumer harms, to put in place rules like net neutrality protection. So there's this whole question of authority and what parts of the government are empowered to provide oversight and protect consumers and protect internet users in that context. And what we saw, um, just for a bit of, of background, uh, we, when, the, when the Federal Communications Commission in the U United States adopted the net neutrality rules in 2015, they put the internet and the provision of internet service on, on that strong legal footing. They said, the FCC is empowered in this context, they do have authority over internet service providers and can step in when internet when um, when internet users are being harmed. That was true for net neutrality, but that also opened up the authority for the FCC to much more clearly intervene on issues of affordability, um, access more generally and, and consume when, when consumers were or when internet users were not getting the service that they they paid for, that they had recourse, they had someone an expert agency in the government um, that they could go to and say we need uh, we need a better solution. All of that authority was was undone under the most recent federal communications leadership, um, with the, with the former chairman of the FCC essentially saying abdicating all authority over the internet and leaving internet service in this unregulated bubble, um, which as we've seen in the context of the pandemic has has meant that. Um, the, the federal government in the United States has been ill-equipped to, to fully step in and ensure that the communities who need connectivity most have it. Um, and so I think, you know, tying that all together, I think we need an empowered um, expert agency to, to intervene, to be able to intervene and oversee this, this market and this industry in a way that puts internet users front and center in the conversation. 
no, actually, that that makes a lot of sense. But uh, moving over for us, uh, what we have realized is that with great power comes great responsibility, and yeah. we really can't leave uh, leave each of them or leave the community at their own devices. So, what mm -hmm. uh, given them access and you've given them affordable access? Now, how do you how do you help them adopt? What are your digital adoption strategies that you have carried out to make sure that the process is inclusive and it's also making sure that they are online for a cons consistent period of time, uh, you know, for their workforce or for someone who's studying uh, and how does it empower someone on an individual level? Great. Um, so before I answer that question, Rashi, if you'd allow me, I just, have uh, have uh, you know a, a little comment to add uh, to Sarah's comment over here. Uh, actually, it's more a question. Um, there is an element of policy and governance. There, you you spoke about them in in two different layers. So I'd I, I'd love to understand that a little more. Where government is, the government's job is to create the policy. Uh, and the framework through which a regulator will implement anything that the private sector and public are doing? Is that what you're proposing? So uh, th there are some nuances, I suppose, in the, the way that uh, federal agencies operate in the United States. So mm -hmm. there is an enabling statute uh, that's, that is passed by Congress, which gives federal agencies the authority to, in the, in the case of the, the Federal Communications Commission, promulgate rules, create rules of the road for how a specific sector is, um, is, is overseen. Um, it, hmm. We've seen this in phone regulation where there are guardrails to ensure that, and, and subsidy programs that were predicated on the notion that everyone should have Universal access to to phone the phone network as it was as it was being built out. Um, we we have rules that govern broadcasters and mobile providers, um, and so this becomes a question of in, in a purely le a legal question of what the FCC has been granted the authority to oversee, and courts mm -hmm. in the United States have upheld that it is proper for the FCC to oversee the internet service provider market. And it, to be clear in this instance, I'm talking about internet service providers as a conduit of the internet access. So not the internet, the content on the internet or the internet itself. So the provisioning of service to, to internet users. And, and we, had a, we had that frame, that regulatory framework in place from approximately uh, February of 2015 to December of 2017, I believe. Um, and uh, things were successful, nothing broke, the markets didn't fail. Um, it was a, a system though of regulatory oversight and intervention where obvious uh, user harms were occurring. So that's the sort of thing I'm proposing, not a, um, a fully government run internet um, by any means or uh, or even heavy handed regulation of the markets itself, but rather targeted oversight with, um, with in protection of internet users at the center of uh, those regulatory interventions. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I think the internet will, off, it will now be termed as a basic need if it hasn't already been done. So, so uh, if, if um, uh, policies and regulatory frameworks are designed with that in mind, I think everything uh, will will hopefully fall in order. Um, Rashi, to your your question. Um, so again, the dream that I bring is all about a specific kind of people, right? But the the journey of of uh, making them aware of the potential of being uh, connected to uh, an entire world outside their you know mountain. Uh, 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 village located in the mountains is so exciting. I think opportunities for upskilling and reskilling will come from there uh, once once they define uh, you know the kind of jobs uh, or, or 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 things that they're interested in, people are interested in and of course all of the great things that Amrita said the inequalities uh, that come with this access will show up 
but it's a learning curve. I think we need to we need to make this connection available to people and then fight the good fight to, for, to make sure that every, everything is equitable in that. Um, and, and this as a citizen I can do, but as private sector, I don't think it falls uh, entirely under my scope, but, but this citizen happens to be part of the private sector. So I, I bring both my perso personas to that, to that good fight. Um, I, I, I do think it is important uh, to mention that uh, skilling and upskilling and reskilling is, is going to be uh, very important in create, continuing to create value. Uh, and and that's not that's not only true for uh, the unconnected; it is also also true for the connected. So there's an, the entire world is is going to get um, their the reference points are going to be redefined. Oh, that's so, important. That. And also, it also might contribute towards uh, the digital economy where you have a lot of people from the rural areas who actually migrate to urban settings for promise of a new future. But I think this pandemic has made us realize that we can actually work from anywhere and we can see, I hopefully see a huge rise uh, in, in remote work and rem normalizing remote work, especially uh, in our Desi culture where you have to have a little more trust. Uh, but great points there. And I'm going to now move on to the audience questions. We have four questions so far, but please uh, feel free to send them in. Uh, I'm going to move on. There's a question for Amrita, which says, the Reliance Network's game-changing move years back brought prices tremendously down. Actually, I did mention, I did revert to it on the chat. Do you want me to speak about it again? Because the questions which came, I have reverted on the chat. Okay, you have okay. So the so and have you also reverted? To, how how do we make digitization more inclusive? And who wants to pick that pick on that? I did mention that too. So I did uh, revert to Sikandar on it. Um, I, I think uh, you know policies when they are drafted need to be more nuanced. For example. Uh, the people whom you want to connect should be there in the table. Um, for example, uh, you know, if you want to connect women in rural areas or even young people, you have to have them in the table. What kind of internet do they want? What is it you are looking at? So uh, it's important to make it inclusive. If you want to connect people uh, from, from the minorities or even uh, rural populations, you have to have them uh, so that you know what their wants are, what their demands are, how they want to use it. Based on it, I think, uh, if decision makers have to make policies or it would be more nuanced. So uh, the, the one of the thing is to have every stakeholder on the table when policies are being devised. That would make it a bit more inclusive. But Amrita, we also see in the absence of, of robust policies, what do you think that they are the most pressing issues in digital governance? I mean, we just saw the recent IT law with with amendments and how do you think the pressing issues in digital government can be tackled especially in terms of when you have informal communities that get into community networks or municipal networks or as as Sarah said mesh networks and we have we do we do have an example in Karnataka that's run by an IIT Bombay professor called Sabani so maybe you could highlight a little bit about what are the issues that you've seen in digital governments so when uh, the concern um, at times is government has very good intent when policies are being made. However, many a times the policies do not take the rights of people into consideration. Um, you know, for example, certain rules, regulations are made wherein um, they are made with good intent, but uh, they may be stifling to many communities they may be you know the after effects of it may be you know when you're connecting people as uh, you know you need innovative ways in connecting the community network uh, by iit bombay or even um, some way internet uh, society has been funding are great ways in which communities can be empowered to have the uh, the connectivity uh, and you know to sustain it which it is good but then you have various ways in which you can do it there are places where you may have to use a satellite there may be places where community networks work or even the cscs or the uh, community wi-fi which the government is planning if it is done in a particular way would help um, but again when this when policies are being made 
uh, they are made with good intent, but I think there should be more communities involved so that the voices can be heard and all issues can be taken into consideration. And that is something which is concerning at times because you know we have a lot of regulations which are coming up. They are good, but uh, certain things are missing at some point of time. And that's where our concerns, especially the rights of people, um, how you can protect your uh, the individuals, the, what would be the government oversight when such rules come in, uh, what would be the liability of the platforms or the others. So those are certain things, uh, the cybersecurity part, the privacy part, uh, those are important. For example, India still doesn't have a privacy law, though it is in the making, uh, but without that, how would the, with so many people coming online, generating so much of data, how can you protect their legitimate interests and rights, which they may not be aware of? So those are certain questions, I think, which are very pertinent at this time. I'm going to now move on to an audience question, which says, hey, I find it really helpful if people could share how digital inclusion and exclusion affects mental health and emotional well-being. I can see it's difficult for people, but is there any research or data that provides some specifics as to someone's talking about the overuse of uh, of the internet over here? And is there any anyone from the panelists who wants to take that? Um, I did respond to it in the chat, um, as in there is no, I, I have not come across data, there may be, of how uh, exclusion affects mental health. However, there are researches being done on how internet addiction can help, you know, affect mental health. But personally, I do feel that someone who is online and is not being able to access internet uh, does feel excluded, does feel stressed. Um, I'm sure that people who are accessing the internet and those who have not accessed internet may have um, may feel inadequacy of not being able to access the things which someone is. But I, I have not come across any such research. Perhaps we have still not reached a position where we have everyone connected, or you know, for us to get everyone connected in uh, at least a developing country or emerging country like India is a priority first. No, that's true. I'm not sure if we have time to wrap up for it, but from what I understand is that uh, we've 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 kind of come to a consensus that we need to be mindful about the different needs and and look at look at solving the issue, the infrastructural issue, which is a technical issue from a humanistic lens. And we also need to look at the fact that the current policies don't necessarily account for the social and cultural context. And you need to include the communities, especially people with disability or women, right, right, right from the technical process to the policy process. And also with, with access also comes a lot of digital skills where we need to understand what are the ways and measures that we can keep ourselves safe, right? For example, we need, we, there's so much reliance on encryption for digital payments, e-commerce. Uh, what are the different password management systems that are there? How do we get rid of issues like cyber stalking, cyber theft, online harassment, and gender-based violence? So these are pressing issues which, uh, if we build our digital competencies, would be served. Uh, we have over a minute, and maybe if we have any last comments or final thoughts, uh, and then I'd go in with the word of thanks. Anyone? I just no, I think remind that we have to also, while designing this, there's a remote population in all countries. And let's not exclude them from the table, as Amrita said, let's have them represented also because they have the certain uh, priorities for connectivity and uh, it should always be represented on the table, so. Go ahead, um, Amrita. Amrita. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think it is if we want to enable internet for any everyone in the same equitable manner, uh, we need to have everyone working together. Not no single person can do it. And internet has to be owned. I would say I missed this point. We have had a lot of shutdowns, but it actually doesn't help. There may be different solutions for it. Internet has to be available for everyone, just like electricity is. It is an essential service today. So it should be available, affordable, and accessible for everyone. Thanks, Amrita. And I would yeah. just emphasize the affordability point. I think particularly um, in, our, in our experience in the, in the United States, that this is really the, the dividing line between folks who are able to connect and those who are not. And 
we haven't done enough yet in this country uh, to to from a policy standpoint to really bridge that gap. And we're, there's there's good steps happening. Um, a, an emergency broadband benefit was was uh, passed into law last December that will give households qualifying households a fifty dollar a month subsidy, which will go a long way um, during this pandemic to to get folks connected. But that's not the we need a long term solution as well. And um, so that will be the continued focus of our of our work in the coming months and years. No, this um, yeah, uh, actually, unfortunately, this brings us to the end of the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for such a lovely conversation. Um, and this obviously wouldn't have happened without uh, the partnership that we have with Future Tense in New America. Thank you so much for hosting the event. Uh, also, a final reminder that we'd love for you to take the Davos Lab survey if you want your suggestions to be incorporated, because we would be sharing the report uh, at the annual meeting happening uh, this August, hopefully in person uh, in Singapore. Uh, and yeah, thank you all. I'd also like to thank our supporting partners, DCN Network, which is an international network of experts who work on digital communication issues and policies across Africa, Asia, and Europe. I'd also like to thank Network Capital. And with that, we come to an end, my friends. Uh, thank you so much. And we, you should also be sure to RSVP for next week's Future Tense event on how will we learn in the future. Uh, thank you so much, and it's been a pleasure moderating this session. Thank you, Rashi, and everyone for having us.